Hello, good morning everyone. So uh, this presentation is about pub publishing and processing big data with both GeoServer Databricks in Azure. So I'm Nuno Oliveira, I'm a software engineer at GeoSolutions. As we may know, we deal with a couple of open source projects, some of the main ones, GeoServer, MapStore, GeoNode, GeoNetwork, and we embrace open standards in everything we do. And not only we embrace them, we also participate on the tests, pilots, to improve them as well. Okay, so I will start this presentation with discussing a bit uh, what's big data. So what is this about? Why? Because usually the definition we hear about big data are the typical TV. So is when we get a lot of data coming in very fast and with a lot of variation. But in practical terms, this necessarily doesn't mean that we actually need big data technologies to handle our use case. This is what we are going to see during these presentations. So, I, I like a lot more the practical definition from Wikipedia, is that big data is when the current system we have basically cannot handle it. So that's when we need to think about the big guns. And of course, we need also to take into account the functionalities, what we need to display to the user. Do we really need to keep all the data we are receiving in the system, only a portion of it? So that's what will decide which type of technology we should use. I'll present a bit the use case that I will use for all the demonstrations during this presentation. It's about maritime data. So uh, long story short, vessels on the sea, add to navigations, anything that is maritime related and is posi positioned on the seas, on the oceans, and that emits a position, transmits any kind of information. So we get all of those events, we have to process them and display them in several type of scenarios. So in terms of numbers, we basically are around, uh, in 24 hours we get 50 million, actually around 60 million uh, as today, and we have to deal with half million ships uh, per day, okay? And uh, we have, of course, peaks of activity during certain times, uh, typically during the night uh, in certain areas, during the, the day near the ports. It really depends if it's a fishing vessel, when they are going to fishing, when they are coming back to the port. And of course, we have the historical data, which is quite consequent. So we have seven years of data, around 125 billions of positions, okay? That's our data set we have to deal with. Okay, uh, and well, this is the interesting bit. So we have all of this information, uh, which is quite big, it's a lot, quite variety, variated, and it also allows us to handle a lot of different use cases. So it can go from the marita maritime track the traffic monitoring, which is the most obvious one, I will say, where you basically want to see the vessels in the sea, what they are doing. We have search and rescue. We'll see that even the aircrafts are going to see for a search and rescue operation. They transmit their positions as well. The add to navigation things that are on the sea that typically we want to notice if they are moving around, if they are staying in the same place, if there's some kind of issues with them. And of course, we have to enrich all of this data. So if I have a fishing vessel, no only that the fishing vessel at that location is not enough. I want to know what kind of permit is us what is fishing, uh, what is this port, where is going, what is doing, that kind of information. And of course, all of this needs to be very inter basically interchangeable with a couple of other systems, and we implemented all of this with GeoServer and OGC services, okay? So, uh, we implemented several scenarios with this data. Uh, visualize the positions in real time, which means we want to know the very last known position of the vessel, where it is at the sea, what it's doing. This is useful for tracking a particular vessel or to understand the activity near a port or a busy area. We want to understand uh, the density maps, what are the typical roles that vessels are taking. Uh, visualize in real time navigation to aid systems. Is there an issue with them? Are they deviating from their usual position? That kind of thing. And of course, the detected ship positions to understand if someone is doing something bad and they just turn it off their sensor. So we detect that with him as satellite and we have to correlate all the data. And of course, the electronic navig na navigational charts and historical ship's positions visualization where basically say, look, I want to know what these vessels were doing three years ago during the 5th of uh, January in the middle of uh, the Indian Ocean, okay? So 
all of these use cases, I will show two of them. So the first one, why? Because here we deal with real time, so we actually don't care about historical data. When we want to deal with the data that is coming in and display it very efficiently. While for the last one, we actually have to deal with all the historical data. So seven years of data, 125 billion positions, okay? So, uh, ah, I was forgetting about this. In all these use cases, we have to deal with authorization. So there is a very extensive authorization system when, I don't know, someone from Portugal cannot see the terrestrial IS positions reported by France, cannot see the positions in the area of Gibraltar. So it's really, really a huge variety, variety of authorization rights. Why I'm explicitly having a slide for this? Because this means that we cannot pre-compute anything. Any selection, depending on the user, the image that will be displayed will be completely different. So no pre-computation can be done at all. Because if you can pre-compute the tracks, well, guess what? The user doesn't have the authorization rights, so we have to rebuild it again, okay? So the first use case is visualization real-time, the let's say, the, the latest position for this vessel in tw the last 24 hours. So every time a vessel reports this position, we have to update the system and display to whenever someone does a WFS request, a WMS request, look, the position for that vessel is that one. Of course, depending on the authorization rights, because if the user cannot see that very last one, you'll be able, you should see the one that is authorized to see which means that in practical terms, you have to store multiple positions for this vessel that match the cardinality of the authorization rights. Just that, opt that optimization will be a presentation per se. Anyway, this system has been deployed in Azure. It is designed to receive 5K positions per second, so around 432 million per day, okay? And of course, positions are enriched with several data sets, which the most significant one is the fisheries one. So this is the deployment on Azure, okay? I've put there, let's say, the Azure VMs. I so wanted to make the math about the cost. Depends on your subscription, on your, let's say, whatever deal you have with Microsoft. Long story short, we have a Kafka, a Kafka cluster. We have an ingestion cluster, a Postgres database, and then we have Geo server that is deployed with uh, Kubernetes, okay? Interesting bits. The Postgres database is the core of the system because it's under a lot of stress. So it gets a lot of writes per second and a lot of reads per second, okay? So we can use this, like for example, using spatial indexes because it will be very good to read the data, but it will be very inefficient to write the data. And you may be wondering why we have eight terabytes of data. So do we have eight terabytes for 24 hours? Not really, it's like 200 gigabytes. But to have the necessary IOPS in Azure, we need to push us that huge amount of disk so the machine give us the necessary networking, the necessary IOPS we need to be super efficient, okay? And of course, we have the ingestion cluster, which deals with Kafka. Basically, the positions land on Kafka, they are processed, they go again on Kafka, and then there is another component from the ingestion that reads from Kafka and store the things in Postgres. Why? So we can have buffers, a proper pressure back, back pressure mechanism between all these components, okay? So this improves the stability of the system, is monitoring, and so on. Okay, well, that's basically what I say. The key here was finding the balance between writing and reading. So yeah, spatial indexes were not an option. I will explain later what we use it. And of course, then we had an extension of processing rules mechanisms, computing positions, filtering positions, that kind of thing. Okay, so for the indexing, this is something we still have to discuss with the, the GeoServer community. It's a new extension we like to contribute. It basically allows to tell GeoServer on the fly, look, I don't have geometries on database, but they have latitude and longitude, so build the geometry for me, so all the spatial operators available on GeoServer work transparently, but behind the scenes, we are sending requests based on latitude and longitude. So we can use numerical index, which is super efficient, and uh, we got top performance in writing and in reading, okay? Uh, yeah, advanced authorization, as I say, I mean, we have to do several extensions, SQL views, we have to, you know, really craft very carefully the SQL and that kind of thing. So this is basically what the final product looks like. 
So this is the maritime picture for Europe, where we can see the vessels draw according to the type. As we can see, even at this zoom level, we are drawing the orientation of the vessel. This is a very costly operation to do in terms of styling. Uh, this is more of the same, but now based on age. This is basically uh, only displaying the fishing vessels, depending on their gear type. Uh, this is a real-time aid to navigation system. This is an aircraft doing a search and rescue operation. We can see that it was turning around at the place of the accident. Uh, this is aid to navigation, so it's the stuff typically we see in the ports. It's basically useful to detect if they are moving, so they had an issue and they are not uh, basically at the place they should be. Advanced projection, in this case the polar projection. And advanced styling, so yeah, this is tricky because we have moving objects, so we cannot just do a couple of requests. The request we do needs to apply the styling we want. In this case, it was about highlighting things. So yeah, for example here, I think we are highlighting all the cargo vessels that have not reported in the last 10 minutes, for example. Uh, okay, this is a video. Normally it should work. There we go. Okay. So of course we cover the whole world. This is the real life performance. So initially when we did the system, it was only mean to have such an advanced style around the coasts. But since the system was very fast, they wanted to see it uh, basically at the world level. Because if we have experience looking at maritime data and just knowing the group of vessels, the orientation of the vessels, there's already a lot of insights that can be obtained from that. So here we are basically just navigating around. And now we are going to apply a couple of filters just to show you know, all the enrichment that was performed behind the scenes. So we are going to get, uh, um, basically, if I'm not wrong, all the, yeah, the cargo vessels around Europe. As we can see, there are quite a lot. And we can definitely see the roads. So they come from China and go to Rotterdam, most of them. And now we are going to look at the ones that have reported in more than 10 minutes. So it's a bit concerning. They should be reporting more often. We are going now to go to fishing vessels. So as we can expect, most of them are around the coast. And we have the big ones in the middle of the ocean. And we can now check. Uh, we are going to filter by the type of permit they have. I know the type of vessel, the FAO type. So these are the long liners, if I'm not wrong. So there is really a lot of vessels that fall into a category especially the ones that can go in the middle of the ocean. And here are the ones that are a permit to fish swordfish. So typically, someone monitoring fishers with uh, the proper layer, lay, layer out will be able to understand if they are at the right place or not, okay? So this was for the first use case. The takeover is that we deal it with uh, a lot of data, so we are receiving a huge amount of data, but we don't really need big data technologies for it, because our use case is to display only the last 24 hours. And Postgres is performant enough to give us the necessary writing capabilities and the necessary reading capabilities, okay? So, now it's about historical vessel tracks. So historical vessel tracks, it's another story, because we have seven years of data, and we may want to go anywhere in time. Look for the data we need. So uh, we implemented this system, once again available through OGC services. And in your use cases, uh, so it's basically user wants to see what the vessel, a group of vessels did in the last month of five years ago, or what vessels were in this particular area. We can afford, let's say, Last seven days, it needs to be uh, blazing fast, okay, sub-seconds, and we need to get the full resolution. All the other time, we can use down sampling, or we can wait like one minute to get the data, but once we get the data, after that initial load time, it needs to be super efficient, okay? And taking into account that one typical vessel in six months will report around 400K positions, okay? So it's definitely not something we can keep in memory and we can just have renderized the browser side. So this is still a prototype, okay? This is something eventually that will be contributed to your server. We still have to discuss with the community. So what we have here is basically an Azure data lake with data bricks in front of it. We have a cluster of just servers. A Postgres database will see later for what we are using it. And we have a nozzle cast for coordination in our cluster, okay? 
The Databricks will basically give us, uh, we are using the SQL endpoint at this stage where we don't have jobs running there. Well, actually we have, but not, uh, let's say, not relevant for this presentation. And we use that SQL endpoint to query the Azure Data Lake. What happens is that we send an SQL, Databricks translate that to, a par to an Apache uh, Spark job, and we'll read the data from the Data Lake, okay? So, uh, Databricks in one minute, because I'm running out of time. So long story short, it provides now two SQL endpoints. The new one is the photo engine, which is quite fast, but as well a lot more expensive. And it's compatible with Apache Stark. I think it's the main engine used behind the scenes. And long story short, as I say, we send an SQL query, and it will translate that on Apache Spark job, and it will read the data it needs from the cluster. We have a patch Sedona that can be used, and it will allow, to use, allow us to use on our SQL spatial operations very similar to the post GIS ones. So we can have the intersects, that kind of things, okay? And uh, yeah, and of course it supports raster and vector, okay? I could do one single presentation about this. So the concept that uh, we are using Databricks, it allows us to send SQL, it reads the data from us, okay? Now, this is the, another important aspect of it. Do we, we already saw, do we all, is all the big data requiring big data technologies to be handled? Not really, some of them are. And we need also to take this into consideration. These technologies like Databricks, Hadoop, Hadoop is even at a lower level. Okay, they are super fast, okay? They have a lot of machines, a lot of memory. Things are super fast, but they are, the scale is completely different from a relation database. So while in a relation database, a query that takes one second is just too long, in such a system, taking a minute is not that long. And we then need to take into account the infrastructure, because if you have such a big cluster running 24 hours per day, that is always ready for you, so things are super fast, can you do it? Yes, but it will cost you an absolutely fortune. Well, typically what happens in this cluster is that they are on demand. So you do a query that is quite expensive. Ah, okay, I need to instantiate more 10 VMs, I need to allocate resources, and this takes time. So that's why it's a completely different scale of time. Database, sub-second, such a system, sub-minute, okay? So, and of course then it depends on the art that was used to set up the data. What index was, in, well, an index in big data typically means partition, the way the data was partitioned, was stored. Did we use a columnar format? Did we use a tabular format? So all of that will have a huge impact on the, on the performance of our queries. Okay, uh, our use case in particular was quite interesting because this data lake supports so many use cases that we cannot just go there and say, look, I will find the perfect partition schema that will make all my queries very fast. We can't, because they are just too different. So we have use cases that are required by the vessel ID, some of them by the spatial area, some of them by the time. And again, we have seven years, 125 millions of them. So we can't just go, we can't basically just, uh, just do whatever you want. Doing a quick demo, so in this use case, we are going to see the vessels for uh, basically six months of data, okay? So we are going to ask Databricks, GeoServer transparently, to load from Databricks six months of data, and behind the scenes to automatically cache it for us in Postgres. So the first time the request takes time, and then it's just managed by GeoServer on Postgres behind the scenes. And uh, I'll jump these slides. Okay, looks like we missed the video. That's, that's good. Okay. There we go. So let me try to play it. There we go. So basically this is for two vessels, six months of data, around half million positions, and just server got the data from Databricks, loaded up on Postgres. Okay, and basically we can see here how fast it is. We can see all the data. Uh, we can see that the performance is uh, really good. And uh, that's basically it. If someone wants to see a more advanced demo, feel free to pass by the GeoSolutions booth, okay? I have some other interesting use cases to show. I guess that's it, I have run out of time. We have this use case where we select the positions 
for, let's say, uh, basically six months of data in a particular area, so we can see all the vessels that are there. So the amount of information is insane, okay? Next steps is basically contribute this to GeoServer, and that's it. Thank you so much.